a sacrifice that some folks make because of their their health problems to come in and then during the children's time Mary Uzo comes in and that's another one. We love you Mary and we're glad you make it. And it takes a lot of time. And, and uh, I'm, I'm saying this to the wrong people because y'all are here. But there's a lot of people, folks that are not here that's like, oh, I just, you know, have a hard time getting out of bed this morning. So I'm going to sleep in and not go to church or whatever it is they decided to do. Somebody put in a song once, Jesus rose from the dead and too many Christians can't even get out of bed. And so it shows the difference in the power of what we've got. So, but anyway, but y'all are here have to say, oh, more people should come because, you know, use the inspiration of folks like Halloween that comes over and, and she got to see Trevor again this morning. And uh, she said she wants to pet Trevor. So I said, all right, we'll, we'll make arrangements for that. But folks, you know, come and, and uh, other people, it's just sort of an option, I guess. So you guys inspire me. Say, so, well, you know, if they can make it, I can make it. And uh, the, the heritage that they've given to us, the, the, the senior citizens, the, the wise uh, folks that have been around the block a few more times than I have, you guys inspire me. And I hope that uh, the rest of us can say that as well. Of course, I've been around the block more times than I want to admit myself. <laughs> okay, uh, one other little thing I want to do before I get started with my sermon. Uh, last night, most of you probably are not aware of this, but we played host to a Boy Scout troop, Muskogee Lodge 221. They left us one of these little thingies. They were from where? North Carolina, South Carolina? At South Carolina, they're on their way out west, and they stopped off here, and they sent, they left us a card. And uh, we sincerely appreciate your hospitality by letting us stay in your place of God. You helped us greatly with the financial cost of our trip to Philmont. And sincerely, the Muskogee Lodge, Warren Hasty, J.D. Martin, looks like, Caleb McClellan, Josh, Eric, and Will. Those are some Boy Scouts that stayed with us last night. It's nice to know that we're able to help in little ways that sometimes people are not aware of. So Susan gave me this, so I want to make sure we don't lose it. So that's good. Ah, ah Luke 22, Pentecost Sunday. I always think of Peter. And let's find the, the right verse here. Uh, Jesus is sitting around the table the night of his betrayal, the Last Supper. And here's what he says. You know, he, was eat, he was eating and drinking and talking and having a good time. And he turns to Simon Peter and he says this. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when once you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now that's a bold statement. You're going to fall right on your face. The devil's going to tear you every way but loose. But I pray for you. Don't worry about it. I'll be with you through that hardship, through that persecution, through that torture. I'll be with you. You're going to come out on the other side, and I'm going to use you that will strengthen your brothers. But Peter said, oh, no, Lord, I'm ready to go both to prison and to death with you. God, bold. I'm going to do all this. And... Peter, I mean, Jesus, I think he kind of shook his head and said, oh, no, oh, Peter, don't do this. And I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you deny three times that you know me. Whoa. Peter said, no, not me. I'll never deny you. I'll be, I'll be right up there with you. Well, skip over to verse 54. Having arrested him, they, meaning the, the Roman authorities, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest, but Peter was following at a distance. After they kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, they sat down together. Peter was sitting among them. And look at what transpired. I'm going to quit reading and sort of just sort of give you the Ballard revised version, okay? Peter's sitting here at this fire, he's warming himself, it's a little cool, and this little girl comes up to him. It was no big motorcycle biker with tattoos and spiked helmets and everything. And this little girl just kind 
of looks up at him and says, Hey, aren't you one of his buddies? Don't you know that guy? And Peter says, No, no, not me. Man. Oh, no, I've, I've never seen him before. I'm like, No, no, I'm, I'm just sitting here with everybody else. I'm just watching what's going on. And then somebody else kind of chimed in on the conversation and said, Your speech, your accent, you don't have a Jerusalem accent. You've got to see a Galilee accent where, where Jesus spent so much of his ministry up there around the Sea of Galilee. Me, me, me from, me from Galilee. No, not me. I've got split level right outside Jerusalem. Just just one about two years ago. Me and the wife and children were all going to do. Oh, no, we're not. Boy, born and bred, always been down here in Jerusalem. And then a third person comes back and says, I'm sure I saw you with him. And then Peter swore and cursed, used words he probably hadn't used for years. I don't know that man. And then Jesus looked at him. And they, they, they made eye contact. And Peter broke down. And on Easter Sunday morning, when the, the women went to the tomb and found it empty, Mary Magdalene found Jesus there. Talk to him, said, go tell the disciples that Peter had risen, I'll meet you. She runs back, says, oh, he's alive, he's alive. And Peter says, won't do me any good. Man, I've blown it. Mary says, he said, Peter, tell Peter, Peter, come. And now we switch to the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. And I... It would be wonderful if we could study and read the whole thing, but we don't have time. So I'm going to just start reading at verse 37. Peter got up and began to explain what was going on when the Holy Spirit fell with, with signs and wonders and, and prophecies. And people were speaking in tongues and people didn't understand it. A lot of people don't understand it today. They didn't understand it then. And they began to make fun of them and that sort of stuff. But... but uh, Jesus, but then Peter began to preach. And in verse 37, it says, Now when they, meaning the multitudes, when they heard what Peter said, they were pierced to the heart because the Holy Spirit was active, taking the words of Peter and piercing their hearts with the truth of the living God. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter, with all boldness, standing up in front, I believe they were at the temple. I think they came there to preach, and they came there to worship, and that's where the Holy Spirit fell. And so Peter, in front of all this throng and multitudes and chief priests and temple guards and Roman soldiers, and in front of the whole world, he says, Repent. And let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word and were baptized that day were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions. It was the 6880 400-mile yard sale. Because I'm sure some people sold all their possessions as much as was on their front yards. Anyway, they were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come and fill us afresh. Fill each of our hearts and give us that fire that burns. Give us that excitement. Give us that boldness 
and help us to stand fearlessly and live fearlessly in a world that is increasingly against you and against our values and help us to stand strong making a difference in our world in jesus name we pray Amen. nobody ever fell so far or climbed so high as this apostle peter we're looking at he was self-confident he was rash he was rough he was a rugged big fisherman as the, as the, the picture of many christians today so many people see peter's the yeah. In fact, I remember seeing a movie, and it was a really neat movie, and, and, and he'd just come to know the Lord. He was up in, in uh, Galilee area, and he was following Jesus and learning from Jesus, brand new in all of this. And people started making fun of him, and they were mocking him, and they were throwing things at him. And he was marching down the road, and he kept saying over and over again, you know, uh, he, said, he kept saying, Father, forgive him. I know what he's saying. He was saying, you know, somehow I forgot now what he said. Well, he was saying something like, you know, give me strength. Help me just to fall. Keep eye on you, Jesus. Help me keep eye on you, Jesus. Keep me out. Keep eye on you. And they kept going over and over again. Finally, he said, Father, forgive me my trespasses. Turn around and just beat the snot out of all of us. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's Peter. Rough, tough Peter. Willing to fight the world. But cowards from the cross. Daring to walk on the water. But not walking with God. When it really counted. He met force with his own will. And he failed. Working on his own. Jesus warned him. Wasn't paying much attention. He acted high and mighty. Others may fail you. They all may walk away. Not me. I'll be with you. Then he denied knowing Jesus and never felt so well. Can you imagine? I am finished. I have Follow, I wanted to follow him. I wanted to die that day. The love of Jesus broke the old Peter and allowed him to become a new man. What made the difference? The answer is the Holy Spirit. In fact, I would, I would wager the Lord was working on him after the resurrection. But I would imagine these 120 people that came into the temple that day just to pray and just to worship on the day of Pentecost. Peter may have kind of hidden in the middle of the 120 didn't want to be seen by too many people. We're just going to go and pray and trust the Lord and see what happens. And then when the Holy Spirit comes and the people started mocking saying, well these people have been drinking too much and they all this. That's when Peter arose to the forefront and with great boldness began to explain what was going on. The most mysterious figure in the Godhead, the most mysterious figure in the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. We know very little about the Holy Spirit. In fact, too often we refer to the Holy Spirit as it, and we need to re refer to the Holy Spirit as He. There is God the Father, there is God the Son, and there is God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was active in creation in Genesis 1-1. It is the Holy Spirit that moves men's hearts. If you have someone you love that is not a Christian, they're not saved. If you pray and ask the Holy Spirit to come in their heart and move their heart, that's what will cause them to get saved. There won't be anything you do or I do, nothing we can say. It takes the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see the truth of Jesus Christ. It is the Holy Spirit. I remember back in the spring of 1971 I was dating a girl who went to church and I went to church with her occasionally mostly to argue with people about God because I was an atheist but I saw in the bulletin pray for Rob Ballard because he's not saved we want him to get saved and I got so mad about that it offended me we're so concerned about offending people and they offended me a couple of months later, when I was by myself, Jesus came into my life. It was June 5th, 1971. I just had a birthday this week. Those of you who are around Wednesday night heard me tell the story, so you have to come on a Wednesday to hear that one. Uh, the Holy Spirit empowered Moses, who ran from Pharaoh, turned him around, and he went back and faced Pharaoh. He empowered John the Baptist. He overshadowed Mary and conceived in her the Holy Son of God. When Jesus began his ministry, the Holy Spirit came down in his baptism like a dove. 
as a symbol. Now he is filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he is equipped to go forth and accomplish his mission. Jesus did not act in his own power. He was led by the Holy Spirit. And if Jesus, the almighty, sinless Son of God, said, I am dependent on the Holy Spirit, where does that leave us? Without the Holy Spirit, we are nothing. That's what we have to have. John the Baptist stated that one would follow him who would baptize in the Holy Spirit. Peter was a believer in Jesus, but that was not enough. You see, today the work of the Holy Spirit is lacking in the lives of most Christians. Being saved is not enough. I'll get you to heaven. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit. You must be baptized in the Holy Spirit to really reach maximum effectiveness for the kingdom of heaven. And I'll lose my period. This has become controversial. The experience has been called baptism of the Holy Spirit, baptism in the Holy Spirit, filling with the Holy Spirit, empowering of God, anointing of God. I don't care what you call it. The question is, have you got it? Do you have the Holy Spirit living with power, living and active and going through you to make a difference in your world? I want to read something here from a book that Billy Graham wrote, or said. Billy Graham said this, and I said it in 1949 in the Greater Los Angeles Crusade. The very fact that we believe one thing and some of us another does not do away with the fact that God says, be filled with the Spirit. I believe it's the greatest need of the Church of Jesus Christ today. Everywhere I go, I find God's people lack something. God's people are hungry for something. Many of us say that our Christian experience is not all that we expected. We have oft recurring defeat in our lives. And as a result, across the country, from coast to coast, there are hundreds of Christian people hungry for something they don't have. And I'm persuaded our desperate need tonight is not a new organization or a new movement nor a new method. We've got enough of these. I believe the greatest need tonight is that men and women who profess the name of Jesus Christ be filled with the Spirit. We're trying to do the work of God without supernatural power. And it cannot be done. When God told us to go and preach the gospel to every creature and to evangelize the world, he provided supernatural power for us. That power is given to us by the Holy Spirit. And it's more powerful than atomic power. Now in 1949, atomic power was big news. World War II had just ended. We had seen the destruction in Japan of atom bombs. And he said the power of God is bigger than that. It is more potent than any explosive made by man. Do you know anything of the power of the Holy Spirit? Ephesians 5, 18 says, Don't be filled with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now that tells me something. He's comparing being filled with the Holy Spirit to being drunk with wine or alcoholic the beverage. Now what happens if someone is standing here, you know, and they say, I'm not feeling good, or I'm feeling really happy, and I want to celebrate, so they start hitting the juice. And then as the alcohol begins to go in their body, it takes control of their body. And it changes their behavior, it changes their outlook, changes, you know, they're not the same person when they're drunk. You know. Well, the Holy Spirit needs to do that. We need to let the Holy Spirit come in our life, and people will say, wow, they're not the same person now. Because it's Jesus living in them. We could say it's the alcohol living in the drunk. But here's what happens. What happens if you take this alcoholic and you lock him in the drunk tank at the jail and he stays in there three or four days? He, well, he gets sober, but he goes back to the way he used to be. We can come to church and we can even come down to the, to the altar and say, Lord, I'm serious. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to be different. I want to follow you 100%. Give me your wisdom and your boldness and your courage and your love, and he'll do it. And you walk out of here and you're charged, and people Monday and Tuesday will say, wow, that person is not the same person. But by Wednesday or Thursday, the Holy Spirit has kind of worked its way through your system, and you're back to being the old you. If you want to be a real drunk, you got to keep on drinking so you stay drunk all the time. Because if you don't, and once you stop drinking, you'll go back to the way you were. See the comparison? 
if 